Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation to speak here. It's really nice to be in Montevideo. Uh, so I probably, uh, many of you have already heard me speak about these things. Uh, so you will probably be bored, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, uh, what I will speak about is uh, uh, a couple of works with Patrice Le Calvé and Meisam Nasiri, uh, which uh, uh, we, are, we are finishing the second part, like the first part was uh, uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, the second part kind of completes, uh, in a sense, uh, the picture. Uh, so I, I try to give the whole picture this time. So, uh, so the, the, the general problem that we are interested in is, uh, is the following. We have uh, a surface, orientable, and uh, a homeomorphism, which uh, preserves orientation. And uh, we, want, we have a, an open connected set, which is invariant by the dynamics. And we assume some kind of some nice property of this open set. For instance, that it has finitely many topological ends or something like this. But uh, for the, <coughs> usually the problem reduces to this simpler setting that I will, will be the, the main focus, which is uh, we, we assume that the open set is uh, simply connected. It, uh, it's much easier to consider simply connected set and the, the more general situations can be reduced to this case, so we will consider this case mostly. So the question is, uh, we want to, to study the dynamics in the boundary of these kind of sets. So uh, the, the dynamics in the boundary and the relationship between the topology of the boundary and the dynamical restrictions that you can have because of this. The idea is that the boundary of uh, an open set of this kind is kind of like a one-dimensional object, in, in a way. But on the other hand, as I will show later, uh, it can be really bad topologically. So you co it could contain very complicated dynamics. So there is uh, an interplay between the topology and the dynamics. And we want to understand. The motivation for, for this problem comes in part from uh, some problems in CR generic uh, dynamics of area preserving diffeomorphism. Uh, for instance, when you have, I have a picture here. The typical picture that you see when you take an area preserving uh, diffeomorphism is something like this. You have these this invariant islands, which are produced by a KAM phenomenon. You have elliptic periodic points that create a bunch of invariant uh, circles. And then you have, in the complement of these islands, you have this region which is like called the, like, uh, the instability region, some region where the dynamics is chaotic in some sense, or supposedly, at least. Uh, so the question, uh, one of the problems was to, was to try to understand better this kind of picture in the general setting, because uh, locally, when you have th this kind of phenomenon, these elliptic islands, they are very well understood from the local uh, point of view, it's KAM theory, but, uh, but if you, if you for instance, if you take uh, bigger and bigger invariant circles here, and you take the, 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 the biggest one, the biggest, uh, the maximal invariant circle containing this, this point here, uh, the topology of the boundary of this circle, well, we don't know much about this, and the dynamics as well. Usually, uh, you know that near this point, you have invariant circles with irrational rotation number and a bunch of things, but here, in the maximal, in invariant disk, we don't know very well what can happen. We don't even know a priori if, if this disk can be like very large and bounded in a, in a way. Uh, so this was one of the motivations. Uh, well, and there are other related questions. For instance, when you take, uh, when you take the stable manifold of a hyperbolic periodic point and you look at its closure, you have a compact connected set which is invariant. Uh, and then uh, the connected components of its complement, well, they are open. If the, if the map is area preserving, the, they are open periodic sets. 
and these sets have a nice boundary in the sense that I was saying there. So you can try to, if you want to understand the closure of the stable manifold of a periodic point, it makes sense to study the boundary of the complementary uh, invariant sets. So that was also one of the questions. Okay, so let's consider the, the model case, which is when you have this simply connected invariant set, and uh, its, uh, its boundary is a circle. So it's a, it's a disk, my set. It's a closed disk. So in that case, everything is nice. We have a dynamics. Uh, the, the boundary is a circle, so the dynamics in the boundary, well, you can define the rotation number. And you, s you can say, as everybody knows, that if the rotation number is irrational, then you have uh, no periodic points in the boundary. And you have a semi-conjugation to a, to a rigid rotation on the circle and you have a unique minimal set, uh, which is either the whole boundary or a counter set. In the, in the case of the rotation number is a rational p over q, then you know that, uh, well, there are fixed points for fq. In fact, all periodic points are fixed points of fq. Moreover, all non-wandering points in the boundary uh, are periodic points of fq. If it fixed points of FQ, right? And in particular, this implies that when you take any point in the boundary, if you iterate it, it converges towards an orbit of period, a periodic orbit of, uh, of period Q in the future and in the past. So the dynamics in the boundary is very, very simple uh, in the rational case, and the irrational case, it's basically, it's very similar to the rotation dynamic. So the question is, uh, can we reproduce this for a general boundary when it's not a circle? And here, the point is that the, the boundary can be really complicated, what, what I was saying at the beginning. So here is a, just a simple example. This is not so complicated, uh, but it's already not a circle. This is not locally connected. But then you can have something like this, which, OK, it's still not so complicated, but a bit more, or something like this. So the, the open set here is, uh, is the region, the complement of this spiral, right? So it's uh, now it, all the points in this outer circle, they are very bad because you can't go towards them with an arc from the open set. But then you can have... Is, is the outer circle in the picture or is it just the limit of the spiral? No, the, the outer circle is part of the boundary of U, yes. It's just, it's just an example anyway. I mean, you can... Uh, but here is a much better example, which is, uh, this is called a cluster continuum, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's nowhere locally connected. And this can be the boundary of a disk. I mean, in this case, the disk would be the disk containing infinity in the plane. So uh, it's boundary of this disk. And it's, uh, it's very far from being a circle now. Now this really, I, I can't... Because this one, well, you can say, OK, but there's some thir circle there. But here, it's really nothing to do with a circle. Mm -hmm. no way. And then you can have things like this. This is the Wada Lakes continuum. The continuum is the black part. The, the blue parts are, are uh, one, two, three, three invariant uh, uh, disks. Not, so, not invariant, there is no dynamics. There are three disks, topological disks. Uh, which they share a common boundary, which is the black part. So the boundary of any one of these three disks is the same set. And this set is, again, nowhere locally connected. It's really bad. So if you look at the complement of this set, there are three disks plus the unbounded disks. Uh, this set in particular appears uh, very often just like this one appears. This one appears, or something very similar, when you, take, when you have a homoclinic intersection. Like you take the, unsta uh, the stable, unstable manifold and you look where it accumulates, you get something like this. Uh, here, uh, this appears when you have something like a plicking attractor, a hyperbolic attractor. You always get pictures like this. Uh, you can, if you are on the torus, you can have si something like this where, where the, the open set is the black thing, the, the dark thing. And it spirals, accumulating on something which lo locally looks like a counter set times an interval. Uh, 
also very far from being a, a circle. So that's the point. I mean, the point is you can't just say, okay, I will define a rotation number and reproduce what we do in the circle because the boundary can be very different. Oh, here's the, 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 the one of the worst things that may happen in a way, which is the pseudo circle, which is a, 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 a compact connected set, which is the boundary of a disk, <coughs> but it's, uh, it's not only nowhere locally connected, it's also uh, it doesn't contain any arcs. So whenever you have a continuous function from the interval to this set, it has to be constant. So it's really bad uh, from the topological uh, side, locally at least. When you, when you zoom in, you always see things like this. You zoom in more, you see things like this. There's nowhere. You can't find an interval in there. OK. So what do we do? Uh, how do we define? Yeah? Sorry? All of this, so the, the, this one, the water legs, it's a, it's a plicking attractor. So it appears a, as a hyperbolic attractor. This one also appears dynamically. And this one can, can also be realized. Uh, there are, I mean, there is a uh, construction by, uh, by Handel, and also an example of uh, Michel Hermann, uh, where they do it like an attractor or even as an area preserving an environment set for it. Which this this thing? No, the previous one, the one that is. This one. <coughs> <coughs> the basin of a uh, Yeah, why not? I mean I so normally three you can put more and more doing the same. You can put more and more doing the Oh yeah, in uh, you mean instead of three to you can yeah. Uh, as many as you want, yeah sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, the, 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 the interesting thing about this kind of object is that they appear robustly because they appear as, hy as hyperbolic attractors, for instance. So they are not like pathologies. They are something that uh, you can't avoid. And in Sorry. any degree of smoothness. What's Sorry? The last example? I don't understand. This one? Yeah, it says you have no local atom. So uh, maybe uh, there's something there. It's an open disk, right? It's? It's an open disk. Yeah, it's an open disk. No, no, but this is the boundary of the disk. The in the boundary of the disk, you cannot find any arc contained there. Any image of an, arc, uh, of a, of an interval. Uh, OK, so uh, how, how do we define a rotation number? So the trick is to use, the, to use a compactification, which replaces the boundary. So you take the, the open disk, and you the, the boundary may be very bad, but you can ju you just replace it by an artificial boundary, which is nice, which is a circle. And if you do it right, the dynamics extends to this compactification, and then you have a circle homeomorphism, and you can define a rotation number. And then you can try to reproduce the Poincaré theory on the circle to this new setting. So the way of doing this is uh, using a Caratheodoris uh, prime ends compactification, and it was done, the first time I've seen it done, done uh, dynamically is uh, by Cartwright and Littlewood in the 50s. Uh, and so you can, if, if you do this, I will explain it uh, here. Uh, so uh, what you do is, so the, the idea is instead of, uh, instead of looking at the boundary, you look at the directions. How, how can you appro approach the boundary from within the open set? Look at directions. And you order these directions, and you get something like a circle. And you put a topology there. That's roughly the idea. So the, uh, what you d <coughs> there are two ways of defining this formally. There is a, a dirty way, which is just using the uniformization of the disk. You just take the, 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 the you have the disk, which can be very complicated. But, and, and you have the nice disk. And you have a map here, which uh, a Riemann map. Uh, so you have a dynamics here, and if you conjugate by this map, you get a dynamics here. And this dynamics, you can show that always, as long as this map is defined in the closure of you, in this, in this bad boundary, uh, you can always extend this map to the 
to the circle here using a conjugation. So it's, a, it's just a change of coordinates. So this gives you the nice boundary. Just forget about whatever is outside of you, and you look at it on these coordinates, and you look at the closure. That's it. And the map extends. So do the prime units correspond to the points in the circle of the Here, yes. Yes, the prime ends will end up corresponding to these points here. Yes. But this is, this is absolute, I mean, this is artificial. I'm, uh, I'm I haven't, I mean, I, I am defining prime ends in this way, so yes. But there is a more topological way of defining the prime ends, which is usually more useful. Uh, just, just a remark is that, of course, this map doesn't extend to the closure here, because this, this, uh, this boundary here is uh, maybe not locally connected, and this is locally connected, so you can't. Uh, but the point is that this, the dynamics, does extend to the closure. Uh, so the, the topological way of defining prime ends, which is the more useful one, is uh, to do it, I will choose a marked point here, just to simplify. I mean, we don't usually do this, but it's, it's easier if I do this. I just fix a point here, uh, and I will define some, some things. So a crosscut, a crosscut of U is just an arc joining uh, joining two points of the boundary of U, and which is otherwise completely inside of U. Just the endpoints are in the boundary, and the arc is inside of U. So this is a crosscut. And then a cross section is, wha is one of the half halves. This, this thing di divides U into two halves. So I will denote by D of alpha the cross section which is the one not containing P. That's why I chose P, just to have a, a reference. So this is the cross-section D of alpha. And then you can order these cross-sections. If you have another, if I have another uh, cross-cut here, and I have D, this is alpha prime, D of alpha prime, then you say that alpha prime is smaller than alpha because D of alpha prime is contained in D of alpha. So this gives you an order between, between uh, cross-cuts by looking at the corresponding cross-sections, a partial order. So the nice thing is that, well, of course, cross-cuts are mapped to cross-cuts by the dynamics. Everything is nice. And so uh, uh, to define a prime end, what we do is we look at nested sequences of, of cross-cuts or cross-sections. So you just take, you take a, a cross-cut here, a smaller one here, a smaller one here, and so on. And you look at the corresponding cross sections. And you require that the diameter of the corresponding cross cuts goes to zero. And you look at this chain of cross, uh, of cross cuts, uh, modulo some relation, because you will have many ways of representing the same object. I will show a picture uh, soon. But uh, the relation is the following I will say that two chains of cross cuts are equivalent if, it, if they have the property that. Whenever I fix one element of one of the chains, the elements of the second chain are eventually inside of this one, and vice versa. Because they go, they go towards the same direction in some sense. So in a picture here, so these are, this is a chain, and uh, this is an equivalent chain. They define the same thing. But of course, this is, a, this is a part where the boundary is nice. Here is a part where the boundary is not so nice, but here is a chain. And this defines a prime, the diameter goes to zero, so it defines a prime end. But you can see here that prime ends don't correspond to, uh, to points of the boundary necessarily. Because here, what would be the point of the boundary corresponding to this, uh, to this chain? You have a whole segment here that you are accumulating in. So it's a, and they're, they're more complicated things, but I can't show nice pictures <coughs> of them. So this we have to do. So the point is, you, you define the space of uh, the set of prime ends as the set of all chains, of decre uh, decreasing chains of, uh, of crosscuts, uh, modulo this equivalence relation. And you can show that this is a circle if you put the, the right topology there. So that's the, the topological way of defining, and it's equivalent to this one. OK. Then But wh wh what do you mean? What, what are the prime ends? It's a circle. So I can't show you a prime end. 
So you just draw a sequence of things with diameter going to zero and you get <laughs> No, it's really, I mean, it, uh, there are no nice pictures that I can show you to. Uh, maybe, maybe, okay, let's, you mean here? Well, he, here, for in, here you can, I can show you, uh, like, here you have some channels. So you see, the, the, for instance, the darker circle, it, it has like a tongue that goes and spirals and accumulates everywhere. So this tongue, it will correspond to one prime end in a way because you can choose a sequence of increasingly uh, smaller uh, cross cuts which goes away towards the tongue and then you, this defines one prime end. But, but this is an easy way. Here it's harder to, the, to find an image of what a prime end is. Okay. So the Sorry? No, 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 it's just a homeo. Yeah, it's, I mean, even if the dynamics here is uh, smooth, uh, everything is zero here, okay? But it's inverted. But even, it's yes, yes, it's a homeo, yes. <coughs> yeah, in fact, there's a nice thing that here, if the dynamics is holomorphic, then here, <laughs> here it's, uh, uh, it's holomorphic as well. That's, that's a nice thing about the, but. Is the diameter of alpha is that goes to zero. If you look at the cross section, it can be really huge. It can be that for all the cross cuts, the cross uh, cuts, the, the corresponding cross sections are huge, and you can't avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. The intersection of the cross sections. Well, it it will be empty, but if you take the closures and you intersect, it could be that you always get the whole boundary, for instance. This is what happens in the pseudo circle. So it's really, it's really bad. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is now that we defined the, the prime ends, so you have a dynamics on the prime ends because uh, F maps sequences of cross cuts to sequences of cross cuts. Everything is nice, so you can do the dynamics in the prime ends. You can define a rotation number there. And the question is now how, what, how do we relate this? Uh, rotation number with the dynamics in the boundary, on the real boundary, not in the prime end. So uh, for instance, the, first, the basic, first basic question that you can <coughs> ask is, if the rotation number in the prime end is zero, then do you get a fixed point in the boundary? And well, in general, in general the answer is no. Uh, here's a picture. So the disk is, uh, the disk is some, something that spirals towards uh, another disk with here in the future and in the past, and the dynamics flows from one to the other. That's all. It's just like a translation, but this is a rotation, uh, rotating disk. This is a rotating disk, and here the dynamics flows from one to the other. And my disk U is this smiling thing. So what happens? The boundary of U doesn't contain any fixed point because this boundary side it flows towards there, this flows towards there, here everything rotates, here everything rotates. In the boundary of U, there are no fixed points. But if you look at the prime ends, the dynamics in the prime ends are, uh, is like this. The circle of prime ends, this is the dynamics. It's a North Pole, South Pole. And you can clearly see this because <laughs> if you take a cross cut here, its image goes inwards. So this must happen also in the circle of prime ends. So if you take a cross cut here, it goes inwards. So everything flows from one side to the other. So in the prime ends, you have fixed points. So the rotation number is zero. The prime end rotation number is zero. But in the boundary, you don't have fixed points. So this is bad. But the observation here is that you, you have this situation where you have a cross cut which is mapped strictly inside, inwards. So it's kind of like an attracting region. So uh, I will call this a trapping cross cut. When you have a cross cut which has the property that its image goes inwards, either to the future or to the past. Uh, so what happens here is that uh, you, you don't have a fixed point, but you have a tra trapping cross cut. And in fact, uh, Carter and Littlewood, in that paper I mentioned before, 
they showed that, uh, and it's actually a very simple argument, that if you have a, a, if you have a zero rotation number in the prime ends, then either you have a fixed point in the boundary, or you have a trapping crosscut. So the only way it can fail is that you have this situation where something is attracting things towards the boundary. And in particular, if you, if you know that F is area preserving, for instance, you can't have this. You can't have trapping crosscuts if, it, if it's area preserving. So in the area preserving setting, things are nice. Zero prime ends rotation numbers implies fixed point. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah? Assuming that, so, I think you've been saying that the, the, the dynamic constant is in the prime end, on the, the full boundary. Yeah? What, sorry? No, when you say, okay, so in your example, the boundary is this half is two circles, and there are four, one, and rotate, the other yeah? rotation, and it's not transitive, so that it's not region that is invariant, it's not a full circle. Yes. So the question is, can I leave you Zero, this implies in the boundary there is an invariant region that is not a full boundary. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, the, uh, the w one thing that we did with the uh, with uh, Rata here uh, is we we uh, uh, we showed that uh, precisely this is the only kind of the, o the only bad situation that you can have. You can you have. If you have zero rotation number and you don't have a fixed point in the boundary, then you must have some kind of uh, sets which are attractors and repellers, and they are rotating in a way. And the boundary of U is contained in the basings of these things. So it's basically like this. Like both dynamically and topologically, is very restrictive. So it's really a, an exception, this, this kind of situation, but OK. Uh, is that was that the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so wh what about the converse? So here, the point here, the point to remember is that in the area preserving setting, things work nicely. Uh, so the converse. By the way, I don't, I, I don't know if I was clear enough at the beginning, but I'm always assuming that U is uh, on the plane and is a bounded invariant set by a homeo of the plane. I'm just simplifying. I'm, I don't know if I actually mentioned this, <laughs> but it was written there. So uh, the converse is uh, if, the, uh, if the rotation number is not zero, can we say that there are no fixed points? This is the, the other natural question, because this relates to the question of whether uh, when, they rush, when the rotation number is irrational, you have no periodic points, for instance. <coughs> so this is much more difficult. And, uh, and in fact, in general, the answer is no, but it's trickier to make examples. Uh, you have uh, this example by Walker, which is like you have some sort of Denjoa example here with hairs spiraling towards an outer circle. And in the outer circle, you have everything is fixed point wise. <coughs> so these hairs are rotating with the combinatorics of a in irrational rotation, but the outer circle where they accumulate is uh, all fixed points. When you look at the prime ends of these, you will see the Denjoa dynamics. So you have an irrational prime ends rotation number, but you have a bunch of fixed points which are in the boundary of U. U is, of course, the white part here. So this is bad. They are not accessible, right? You can't reach them by, a, by means of an arc contained in you. Uh, yeah. In fact, you, you can't. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if you can make an example where. I don't think you can make an example with accessible fixed points. Uh, you can't. You can't. But uh, uh, there, are, there are other examples which are, uh, in fact, in some sense, more interesting. Like uh, there's a big of attractor, which is something where you have, uh, uh, in the annulus, you have an attracting set which, uh, which contains, like the annulus goes, is, map, is mapped inwards. And you have points there 
which rotate with different velocities in the annulus, like the rotation along the... Uh, so this one, for instance, a fixed point and a, fo a fixed point which rotates one. And then when you look at the attractor that you get in there, you get something which is really uh, topologically complicated. It's <coughs> nowhere locally connected and so on. Uh, but the dynamics contains all sorts of periodic points of all different periods and uh, uh, different velocities and so on. So it's a very... Uh, and this appears as the boundary of a... It's a basin of a tractor, in a sense. So, so in, in, this, in this kind of example, you, get, uh, you, you can get a uh, non-zero rotation number and fixed points and so on. The point is that all these examples, they have the property that they are attracting. Like this example, you can't, if you try to build it, you will end up getting, uh, it's going to be an attractor, basically. The boundary is going to be attracting. Uh, so again, if you try to make it area preserving, you can't. And uh, the, first, the first work uh, we, we did with uh, Patrice and uh, May Sam was to to prove that, in fact, this is the case, that you can't do it unless you have some sort. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a similar thing to the result I mentioned before. Like, you either you have, you realize the, ro the zero rotation number by fixed points, or you have a trapping crosscut. Well, here it's similar. If you have non-zero rotation number, then either you have no fixed points in the boundary, or you have boundary traps. <coughs> I will define them just in a second. But it's something similar to what I said before. And in particular, it's something that can't happen if uh, the map is area-preserving. So as a corollary, if the map is area-preserving, when the rotation number is zero, or more generally, when it's rational, uh, you, you have a fixed point or a periodic point. And when it's not, you don't. So it's, it's really it's exactly as in the circle this time. So the area, again, the area-preserving setting is Everything is nice. So what is a boundary trap? So uh, it's, a similar, it's similar to the notion of trapping crosscut, but of course, you can't have a crosscut that is mapped inwards if the rotation number is not 0. Because of course, if you have, if you have something here that is mapped inwards, then you will have a fixed point in the boundary circle. But, uh, but then, OK, boundary trap is just a union of crosscuts such that the region they bound is mapped strictly inwards either to the future or to the past. Basically, it's that, with some technicalities there. That's In particular, of course, this is not compatible with being area preserving, because it means that you are attracting something towards the boundary. You can't be not wandering in fact, yeah. It could be wandering in the This This thing could be wandering, yes, or not, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But, it, but the point is, it implies that arbitrarily close to the boundary, there are wandering open sets, for instance. So it's very, it's kind of restrictive in a, in a way. So uh, we say that the map satisfies the boundary condition in U if there are no boundary traps for any power of the map. In particular, if F is area preserving, it has the boundary condition. Or if it's non wandering or something like this, it always has the boundary condition. And another case, uh, th this is, uh, the nice thing about this is that the boundary condition also holds, even if you don't assume any kind of area preservation or anything like this, but if you assume that uh, the map is, for instance, holomorphic, as I was mentioning before, and the rotation number is irrational, then you automatically have this condition by completely different reasons. So it's not necessarily a condition that is guaranteed by uh, recurrence or area preservation, it could be, it could come from something. Yes. So the point is, putting things together, is that if you assume the boundary condition, then the, the map, sorry? Not all the more, so how do you rational maps? How do you rational maps? No, no. no. If you have a holomorphic map with an invariant disk, which is, which is, uh, it has to be uh, uh, invertible <coughs> in the, the, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but this was happening in, in we have a single disk and the uh, yeah, So um, 
putting things together, you have the, the nice picture for the area preserving setting, for instance. You have that, the, if the rotation number is rational, you have a periodic point, only of period Q, exactly as in the previous case, and if it's irrational, then you have no periodic points. Uh, but of course, in the circle, we had a lot of extra information. We know in the irrational case, you have a semi-conjugation. In the rational case, you have this thing about all orbits converging to the, dynam the dynamics being very simple. And so uh, you can ask whether the same things hold, assuming this boundary condition or area preservation. And in general, you don't, in the irrational case, you can't expect to have a semi-conjugation to an irrational rotation. Uh, <coughs> for instance, the, the pseudo the pseudo circle, the examples with a pseudo circle with the rational rotation number, the Handel's example in particular, uh, it's not semi-conjugated to an irrational rotation. But, uh, but in some cases, you can, you can uh, with some topological condition, which is a bit strong but not so strong, you can, uh, you can get the semi-conjugation. So we, we some partial result in this direction. Uh, was done by Tobias Jagger and myself. But I won't get into these uh, details. And uh, <coughs> then uh, you can ask whether when the rotation number is rational, you know that the dynamics in the boundary is trivial in the sense that everything flows from periodic points to periodic points. So you think that holomorphic is semi-conjugation? No, no. Even in the holomorphic case, you don't have that. No, no. You don't have a semi-conjugation. I mean, in general, you don't. The, if you, are, do you mean, are you talking about this thing? Yeah. No, this has nothing to do with being holomorphic. This has, is this a topological condition in the boundary. No, the question is, the, non, the, the rotation number is not rational. Yeah. Is there some kind of semi-conjugation, no. Yeah. Even if it's holomorphic, no. In general, no. I mean. If you know something about the topology of the boundary, you can, you can sometimes show uh, the, the semi-conjugation. But uh, even in the holomorphic case, you don't have a semi-conjugation. Uh, so the second question is whether when the rotation number is rational, you have these trivial dynamics. And this is nicer, because the answer is yes. And this is the second part. Uh, uh, of the work with uh, my Sam and Patrice is basically showing that in the rational case everything behaves exactly as in the circle. There, there's no exception. If we assume the boundary condition, everything is nice. So let me state a theorem, which is basically the important part that implies everything, uh, is that if the rotation number is zero, assuming the boundary condition, then Every non-wandering point of the map restricted to the boundary <coughs> is a fixed point. <coughs> so if you know this, in particular, you know that every point of the boundary has to go from fixed points to fixed points. Because the omega limit of an orbit is contained in a wandering set. So it has to be all fixed points. So the boundary dynamics is trivial, in fact. So that's the main theorem, basically. But actually, the theorem is a, the, the proof of the theorem goes through some topological uh, result, which is actually the, 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 the sense of the, pr the, of the proof, um, which is a bit tricky to, to state, but I will try to explain the, the uh, basically it says that, so you, you have this open set. On the on the plane, it's bounded, okay, but it's complicated. I don't know. And then you have an unbounded component here that I called U infinity. I think U infinity is the unbounded component of the complement. And you have U. And then uh, what the what the lemma is saying is that. If the rotation number in U is zero, and uh, and the map is uh, ha and has the boundary condition, for instance, if it's area preserving, then what happens is that the boundary of U infinity is either all fixed points, 
just the identity, basically. Or the boundary of view is uh, compactly generated. So compactly generated means that if you remove a point from you here and you look at the point at infinity, you are on an annulus, right? You can go to the, you can leave this to the universal cover and look at the boundary of view in the universal cover of this annulus. And you will see something like this. I don't know. This is the lift of view, and this is the lift of the boundary. And in general, this, the lift of the boundary can be uh, disconnected. Even though it's connected here, when you lift it, it can be disconnected. For instance, in the spiral example, this example like this, when you remove a point here and lift it to universal cover, you will see a line, which is this circle here, and a bunch of lines, oops, a bunch of lines accumulating like this. <coughs> this is the lifted boundary of this uh, thing. So it's not connected. It has parts which go a bunch of lines. So being compactly generated means that this doesn't happen. It means that you can find here on the lift a compact set in the boundary that when you project it, you get the whole boundary. Here you can't. A, sorry, a compact connected set. Here, if you take a compact set that projects to the whole boundary, it's not going to be connected. OK, so this is technical, but it's, it's really a strong thing to say that the boundary is compactly generated. Uh, and it's actually the sense of, the, uh, of why the other result holds. Because basically, what you do is you use, you take a point which is no wandering in the boundary, and you use some recurrence properties to show that the boundary has to kind of twist and spiral a lot. And if the boundary twists and spirals a lot, then it can't be compactly generated. It's like this. So basically, the topological part is the important one for this. OK. And for instance, a corollary of this topological result, which I find really nice, is that if you take an area preserving map which leaves invariant a pseudo circle, like the Handel example, uh, if you have a fixed point in this pseudo circle, then the whole pseudo circle is the identity. The dynamics on the pseudo circle is the identity. That, to me, that is surprising. Because, in, in fact, one thing is important is that it's not that the topology of the pseudo-circle implies that the dynamics has to be trivial, because the Handel's example has a non-trivial dynamics. It has an irrational rotation number, and it's not semi-conjugate to a rotation, so it's kind of complicated in a way. But if you have a fixed, something is fixed, then the dynamics has to be the identity. OK. So uh, just to mention uh, another consequence of this last uh, result, of the dynamical result, uh, one of the one of the motivations for our first work was a work previous work of Matter, where he showed that in, if, if you take a diffeomorphism on a surface, uh, a CR generic diffeomorphism, which is area preserving, uh, the prime rotation number on an invariant disk is always irrational. This is not a dynamical result because it's talking about the prime men's rotation number. There is no relationship a priori between the prime men's rotation number and the dynamics of the map. So it was kind of an abstract result in a way. Uh, but then, of course, putting it together with the results I mentioned, you get the dynamical information, which will tell you, for instance, that in the boundary of this disk, there are no periodic points. So for a generic diffio, if you take an invariant disk and you look at the boundary, there are no periodic points. And the proof of this, which is really useful for some things, uh, it relies on uh, the following uh, generic conditions. You need to assume that the fixed points are all hyperbolic or elliptic, and that there are no saddle connections. These two are kind of standard conditions that you can require. But then there is an, another condition, which is that the elliptic periodic points have to be generic in a way which is either they are surrounded by invariant circles with irrational rotation number, or they are surrounded by uh, like homoclinic intersections of a periodic point which go around the, the point. Uh, 
any of these two conditions works. But both of the conditions are, much, are, are harder to guarantee than the other ones, in a way. So the, thing, the nice thing about the, the, res the second result, the one I just mentioned, is that you can get a more precise version of this, which the basically doesn't require any generic conditions. You can explicitly state the, the, uh, the conditions, like uh, take, a <coughs> take an area-preserving map, which is uh, smooth, at least in a neighborhood of the boundary of an invariant disk. So I have an invariant disk by an area-preserving map, which is C1. And suppose you have a fixed point here. Well, this fixed point has to have real positive eigenvalues. In particular, it can't be elliptic. You can't have elliptic point in the boundary of a disk. And this, maybe it sounds obvious because elliptic points rotate or something, but uh, it's not really obvious. And uh, the point is I'm not assuming any generic condition. The, the main reason to assume this condition here or this condition, these things, was to remove the elliptic points from the boundary. But the point is, you don't need any condition. They can't be in the boundary. This is not a generic thing. And the proof is really easy. I will, I will explain why, why this is true. So if you, have, if you have a point here, of course, uh, I want to prove that there is a positive eigenvalue. If there is a positive eigenvalue, it can't be elliptic. Because, uh, by the way, yeah, it could be that the eigenvalue is 1. This could happen. But it can't be uh, uh, modulus 1 different from 1. So suppose this, is, uh, this has non-real eigenvalues. So what you can do is you can blow it up. You can blow up the point to a, to a disk. And you, can, you will have some dynamics here, which is defined by the derivative of the map. And the open set here will accumulate on this circle in some way. It depends on how, how, the, thing, how the, po the disk was accumulating in the, in the point. But it will accumulate at least at some points of the circle. And so when you look at the boundary of U intersected with this new circle, blown up, you will get something, which is an invariant set in this circle. In particular, you will get a recurrent point there. There is a recurrent point in this circle, right? <coughs> and the, but the rotation number in U is 0. I'm assuming that. Sorry, I'm not assuming that, but OK. I don't need to assume it, because I, I had a fixed point here. So the previous theorems tell me, oh, if, if you have a fixed point, the rotation number must be 0, right? So the rotation number is 0. So uh, the thing is, you have a recurrent point here, and there was this previous theorem which says, every non-wandering point in the boundary is fixed. So what happens is that any recurrent point here in this circle, which is in the boundary of U, must be fixed. And there is at least one, so there is a fixed point there. But this was the blown up dynamics. So the dynamics in this circle is the projectivized, the normalized dynamics of the derivative. So you have a fixed point there. So this means that there is an eigenvalue, uh, an eigenspace. So you have a real eigenvalue and so on. So that's the proof. It's really straightforward. <coughs> so uh, so as a consequence, if you if you assume that the yeah, I mean because remember that's why we have more general hypotheses. You don't need area preserving. You just need the boundary condition. And because the map was area preserving here. Even if you blow up and you change things, the inside of you, you didn't change much. It still it preserves a, a, posi a measure which is positive on open sets in you, so it has the boundary condition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is the reason that we do these more technical statements, because when you try to make surgeries and modify things, you lose the area preservation sometimes, or you lose the general condition. But, but the, these uh, technical conditions you can usually uh, keep. So as a consequence, if you assume that the fixed points are all hyperbolic or elliptic, when you take uh, an invariant disk, you either, not, you either have no periodic points, or if you do, 
you can tell not only that the dynamics in the boundary is simple in the sense that everything goes from, from, fixed point to from periodic points to periodic points, but also it's actually a union of saddle connections. So it's, it's really like you have here a saddle point, wait, saddle point, whatever, and so on, a bunch of saddle connections. Maybe you have something like this also, I don't know. So this is the boundary of U. But in particular, it, in, in, the, in the rational case, it has to be uh, locally connected because it's an arc. The union of saddle connections, it's an arc. And this is not a typical, it's not very common to have this. So it's really, it's telling you that if the rotation number is rational, not only the dynamics is trivial, but the topology is really very simple under this assumption that periodic points are uh, hyperbolic or elliptic. Oh, well, it's fixed points here. Okay, I'm assuming zero rotation. <coughs> How much time do I have? About ten minutes. Okay. So, uh, oh, by the way, this result, this last result here, was announced also by Fernando Oliveira, uh, ten years, twelve years ago, but uh, still unpublished. <laughs> but uh, uh, and uh, the proof is completely different. Uh, the proof he had. Uh, So, uh, so putting everything together, we have this nice picture for the area preserving setting, uh, which is similar to the picture I showed before for the circle. Even if the boundary of my disk is complicated, I can tell that if the rotation number is irrational, then you have no periodic points and there, here's a thing that I didn't mention, but you can say something about the topology of the boundary. You can say that it's annular, which means it's a, a nested intersection of topological annuli. So it's, it's some kind of topological condition. And the, if the rotation number is rational, it's the nicest situation because it's exactly like in the circle. So you have uh, uh, fixed points in the boundary for, for FQ. Every non-wandering point goes from uh, is fixed, and in particular, every orbit goes from fixed points to fixed points. And you have uh, the additional thing that I mentioned that the boundary is compactly generated in the sense that I explained here. Is the, the this is the basis of attraction of the fixed point? No? Yeah. Unfortunately, no. No, basins are the problem because you see the counterexamples I mentioned at the beginning were all, the problem was that they were basins. They were attracting or repelling. So yeah, you can make like the brick of a tractor. It's a counterexample to everything I'm saying and uh, yeah, and it's a basin. So you, ca you can't improve this in, the, in this sense. So uh, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, I will skip this, yeah. So uh, so the, um, the proof of these results, they rely on uh, Well, one of the main things that we that, that we use is uh, for the for the for the la latest uh, result is uh, a result of uh, Began, Co uh, Corbusier, and Leroux uh, about the existence of maximal isotopies, which is related to previous work of uh, Jolan and uh, Patrice Le Calvé, uh, and uh, uh, we use this to precisely to relate uh, what I said before that. When you have a point in the boundary that is uh, non-wandering in the boundary, this implies that the boundary has to be topologically complicated. It has to spiral in a way. To obtain this, it's really tricky. And we need to first choose ad adequately some maximal isotopies and then do some uh, define some rotation numbers associated to the isotopies and work the way towards uh, the topological result using some linking lemmas and so on. 
So I will try to show, I, I'm not going to say anything about this, but I will try to show the one of the ingredients of the proofs, which I like, which is a, a has to do with the shadows of the uh, of arcs. So the, the 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 idea is you can define the shadow if you have an arc. I have a if I have a my disk here and I have an arc. Uh, let's say a loop, not an arc. I can look at the crosscuts defined by this arc. Here is one, here is another. And maybe you have some other one here, I don't know. Alpha 3, alpha 4. When you look at the prime ends, compactification of U, these crosscuts <laughs> will show up somehow here. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, like this. So and we have some fixed point here, reference point. So we define the shadow of this arc gamma. The shadow of gamma is going to be a subset of the prime end circle, which corresponds <coughs> to the prime ends which are obstructed by gamma from p. So it's this interval <coughs> together with this interval. OK? It's like if you put a light source here, the, the prime ends that become dark are the shadow. Not exactly, OK? No. But if the light bends, then yes. Uh, so uh, the, the, the basic lemma, just two minutes, is that if, if you take an arc like this, which is disjoint from its image by f, so it's free by f, then what happens is that the, the shadow of the crosscut generated <coughs> by gamma is contained in two intervals where the dynamics is just a translation. This is really restrictive. It's really, uh, this is if we assume the, the, the boundary condition, or if we assume that gamma doesn't contain any boundary traps. So what this is telling you, if, if you look at the dynamics of the prime ends, for instance, if the rotation number is 0, you have, maybe you have some fixed points here. And between the fixed points, you have some dynamic like this, which is translations. And then what this is saying is that the shadow of any free arc, which doesn't contain a boundary trap, must be contained in the union of two intervals of this kind. And they have to be intervals with different directions. So this is maybe this is one, and this is one. I plus, I minus. So all the crosscuts must be here. You can't have one here or here. So it's, and this is really restrictive. And this is the key to, to proving the, the, the topological results. Because when you have this, there, well, there's another result, which is the maximal crosscut lemma, which tells you you can find certain crosscuts here, which are maximal in a nice way. And then what you do is you find one maximal crosscut here, one maximal crosscut here. And you look at its image, which flows this way. And its image, sorry, I'm trying to explain the proof of this, actually. So uh, I won't. I won't because I'm out of time. But uh, the point is, uh, when, you, when you locate the shadow of, 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 the arcs, uh, of the arc gamma, you can then use this to prove something similar on the lift to universal cover when you remove the point P. And then you get something like the compactly generated property, what I mentioned before. And with this and the linking lemmas and the maximal isotopies, you get the, the, the dynamical result. Uh, sorry, I'm out of time, so I will stop here. Questions? Yeah. 
I want to ask, uh, when we say about this uh, cross-section, it's very similar when uh, we find classification of one dimensional attractor, for example, plate attractor. Yes. And then it's cross-section on the Lobachevsky plate. Is, is the connection, is the connection between this absolute and zero circle? I'm not sure. I've, 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 I, don't, I don't think I've seen this uh, for the plicking attractor. I'm not really sure. No, indeed, if we delete this uh, disk and contain surface with boundary and consider double of this uh, surface and after that an absolute plane, and then it's possible to find uh, rotation number on this absolute. Uh, it sounds similar. Yes, it's probably it's probably just uh, a, a way of interpreting the prime ends. Yeah. There are many ways you can do this. So probably it's the same yeah, thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it's not invertible. Okay. So in the non for instance, in C square, you have the basin of attraction of zero, and the Julia set is a circle. And sometimes, well, the Julia set is not a circle, but you have a two one map on this kind of circle or, circle or, or prime end in the map. Can something similar can be done in Germany? She knows, I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask the Uruguay, Juliana, or Leva, because, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I've never tried. I mean, uh, but but I know they have something. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for branched covers, you can extend to the boundary, the, the dynamics. And the analogous in some way of the rotation number is a semi-conjugacy to the map C, C square. In the so you have a degree to map? Yeah. On the feet. Yeah. And then you have to solve the having the periodic point in the prime end. It may happen that the impression of the fixed ray is the whole set and it's not a homeomorphism, so you don't know how to find the fixed point. Okay, let's take Andrew's game for a few